So hello everyone, uh, thank you for coming here in this uh, lovely day. Uh, so it's also a nice audience to uh, welcome here because like there are so many different people coming from different fields. Like I mean there are people interested in video games and like game designing but also there are other people who are historians and those who are interested in art history and this kind of other social science fields. So, it's kind of a, a mix that we are here and sometimes the boundaries is not that fixed also because uh, even though we are academicians, we love video games and this kind of <laughs> chains we can see. And before the beginning, I want to thank uh, these two institutions. Like I want to thank uh, Anders Eppfield and uh, Olof Halo uh, and Swedish Research Institute in Istanbul and Emir Alishik and Istanbul Research Institute also because without them, this event would not be happening at all. And please, all of you can come to the stage also to say a few things. Yes, I will just say a few words. I'm, my name is Olof Heyman. I'm the director of the Swedish Research Institute, which is located in Bayolo. This is the first time we are this far away from home to uh, arrange mm -hmm. something, but we're really happy for this mm -hmm. collaboration. So I'm not saying more than that. It's, uh, I can say that it's uh, when Anders and I visited in January, we realized that this is really a location where we would like to do something that is you know, beyond the scope of what we are normally doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Thank you. Thank you for coming here also. Uh, so actually, our uh, general purpose here to uh, discuss how uh, video games reproduce uh, cultural stereotypes and especially how they become some sources for an idealized image of the East. And actually, we will also discuss, as you all know, some elements of the Byzant Byzantinism and also of Orientalism during the panel. Uh, so I want to introduce very briefly our panelists uh, before giving the floor to them. So our first panelist will be Vit Shishler. <laughs> Thank you for coming here. So he works uh, as an assistant professor of new media studies at Charles University's Faculty of Arts in Prague. Uh, and his research addresses critical approach to the intersection of culture and digital media, namely the digital game based learning, serious games and video games and the Middle East. And in his uh, talk, he will analyze the ways in which the Middle East has been represented in video games. And after this talk, we will have Emir Alışık. Uh, Emir. <laughs> uh, Emir is the uh, project manager uh, at Istanbul Research Institute, Byzantine Studies Department. And he is a PhD candidate at the Istanbul University, Art History Department. Uh, and he's working on the reception of Byzantine ideas in Renaissance Italy. Uh, and he also works on Byzantinism uh, in various uh, artistic mediums. And in his talk, he will focus on the virtual reimaginations of uh, Byzantinium. Uh, and our last panelist, uh, Tonya Hogland Sorensen, uh, she is an art and media historian at the University of Bergen, Norway. She works with the reception of the Middle East. Uh, Middle Ages in the 19th and 20th century, with a particular focus on the depictions of North and Byzantine material. In her talk, she will share with us her examination about word making, stereotypes, and representations of Byzantium in computer games. So uh, it's for uh, it's now. I will just give the floor to Vit Vit Shishler, and uh, our panel will begin with his presentation. Okay, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks a lot to the Sci-Fi Library and the Swedish Research Institute in Istanbul for having me here. Uh, yeah, as you see, uh, my talk is uh, labeled Digital Orientalism, Representation of the Middle East in Video Games. And what I will try to do is kind of provide a really brief introduction or, or kind of overview. What are the typical modes of representation in which Middle East is represented, particularly in American and European video games? And it's kind of overview of long research we've done, and it's like kind of like a, just a snapshot. Uh, what is what is there? Uh, before I start, I actually would like to open this talk by by personal story. Um, I actually do research video games. I'm a video game researcher. At the same time, I'm a game designer. Actually, we got a company and we design uh, video games. And I'm also a video game player. I, I love to play video games. And uh, I grew up in the 80s, meaning I belong to the first video game generation. 
So like playing games was like the favorite pastime for us and it's also the way uh, how we socialize, you know, gathering at friends' houses and playing games. But at the same time, I actually grew up in uh, socialist and communist Czechoslovakia, meaning almost all the games we played were imported or smuggled from the West. And I would like to show you, oh, how does it, oh, particularly one game we used to play in the 80s. And it's, a, it's actually a great game, yeah. It's called NATO Commander. And it's a game in which you are sworn in as a new uh, NATO general. And your task is to innovate uh, Euro invade Eastern Europe and defeat the Warsaw Pact forces <laughs> in Eastern Europe. And the geography of the game uh, is actually very realistic. I mean, for the 80s, you know. <laughs> so uh, the game actually starts with your first target, which is Prague. So we need to know, you know, invade and bomb Prague. And I mean, I am from Prague, and I kind of clearly remember playing this game, and I really wanted to finish it because it's a great game. But at the same time, there was some weird feeling about being represented as the evil guys. And I think this kind of personal story opens up the larger topic of video games, entertainment complex, and geopolitics. So let's kind of move further. Actually, today I would say, uh, according to statistics, more than 3 billion people play video games regularly, and they sp spend on average six hours a week playing games. So as Eric Zimmerman has actually argued in his famous Ludwig Manifesto, games today are becoming more and more important medium through which we consume art, design, and entertainment, and we spend our leisure time. Uh, at the same time, uh, video games are still somehow neglected by academia, so I would say they are not subjected to the same critical discourse and critical analysis as other forms of popular media. And though they have like a strong economic relevance and huge popularity, the, the, their cultural impact is uh, not deemed as relevant or it's like not as particular, uh, or some accepted as, as, as, as uh, culturally relevant. So, uh, when we are talking about representation of anything in video games, we have to keep in mind that unlike other audiovisual media, video games have three different representational layers. How, how they got like audiovisual layer, which we know from movies, they got a narrative layer, the story of the game, and they got something uh, we call procedural layer, which is essentially the rule system which governs the player's interaction with the game. And I argue that on all three of these levels, culturally, uh, politically, and other like, uh, relevant messages can be communicated to the player. This even led Jan Bogos to claim that video games open a new form of persuasion, which he calls procedural rhetoric, the art of persuasion through rule-based representations and systems, unlike uh, images, uh, narrative or, or, or, yeah, or moving pictures. So <clears throat> again, I would like briefly summarize what are, let's say, the kind of typical modes of representation. Of course, there are exceptions. It's like a really uh, introductory summary, but I think it kind of holds. So the first level is something I call digital orientalism. Uh, there are actually tons of games which uh, take place in kind of fictitious Middle East, which is, is, is a, those are typically adventure games or action games. And they render Middle East, it's kind of, the Middle East they render is sort of like the Middle East from 1000 and one night. So it's a place, of, it's a place with, with caliphs and, and, and jinns and viziers and, and belly dancers. And you navigate through bazaars and harems and palaces. At the same time, they typically conflate uh, architecture, design and, and, you know, and, and pieces from different, completely different places and different periods. And they, they, what they are render is kind of, kind of timeless, a historical entity, the Middle East, which never changes. Typically, for example, if you look at this, it's Prince of Persia, which is a brilliant game, by the way. It's a brilliant game, and it's, it was a milestone for animation and gameplay. So actually, it's, it's, it's a great game, I love it. At the same time, this game actually is a typical example of what I call digital orientalism, because if you look at it, it actually, uh, it actually conflates pieces from Mughal India with uh, pieces from you know, the, the Andalus and Alhambra, and they are all happening there in the same place. And the, the, the plot is like typically you are playing a young hero who is actually put to, put to prison by evil vizier and you have to save yourself and, and the young princess and then you marry her, etc, etc. Uh, there are actually more and more games like that. Some of them with, uh, let's say, more harmful stereotypes, uh, some with others. But by no means, this is the only way Middle East is represented in video games. There is another level uh, which I label a conflictual framework. And Particularly after 9-11, there's been increase in games, typically action games, most typically first-person shooters. First-person shooters are games where you play a soldier and you play the game from your point of view. And 
There, there are many games uh, which uh, happen in either in real or fictitious Middle Eastern country. Like this one, uh, it's, it's a series by Kuma War. This one is a battle in Sada City, so it's actually a game which recreates the real, the real campaign, uh, real American campaign in Iraq. Some of these games, as I said, uh, are happening in real settings. Some are happening in fictitious but possible future settings, like this game, Assault on Iran, which is actually a game in which you are sent as a... The game was published in 2005, and actually it imagines possible future conflict between the United States and Iran, and you are sent to Iran as a special commando to terminate its nuclear program, which, cost, which of course, the game was source of huge controversy, etc., etc. So some of them happen in uh, real... Middle Eastern countries, but some of them actually happen in fictitious Middle Eastern countries, like this one, uh, Call of Duty Modern Warfare, which is happening in the fictitious country of Uzbekistan, but which is like clearly set in the broader Middle East. Um, and what these games typically do, or how, how they schematize Middle East, these games typically focus on the technology of war. They boast actually, they boast in their promo materials, they boast authenticity and realism. By the way, the games by Kuma War are actually by the authors labeled as news gaming. They're actually saying, uh, instead of following the news, for example, you know, you can play the news. We will provide you enough information to understand uh, the, the world in, in crisis, the world in conflict. So what are the realistic elements in these games? Technology of war, the weapons, the, the topography, uh, the, the um, physical models. Uh, but they do completely, uh, or this realism is highly selective. And they do typically completely neglect the broader, the, the broader context of war, the trauma, and the consequences of war, and especially the perspective of civilians, particularly women and children. In most of these games, you don't find civilians. So the world is kind of, or the Middle East is kind of rendered as a, as a place where uh, war between male soldiers or male combatants happen. Even though some of them recreate missions which were, you know, uh, highly like uh, contested and, and had a huge impact on civilian population. So the children and women perspectives is typically completely missing. So these games kind of, uh, kind of recreate real, real world wars as a pleasurable experience, which kind of invites you to enjoy uh, without without kind of an or without kind of ethical ethical problematic questions, and. Um, then, uh, fortunately, there are actually, uh, there are actually uh, attempts, or let's say there are games, which do present Middle East in far more nuanced and far less schematized way. And you can find them both in the mainstream video game industry, as well as in uh, kind of, I would say, uh, uh, increasing uh, or kind of growing genre, which can be labeled as serious games or critical game or, or even documentary games. So first, there are some games uh, which actually do try to portray uh, Middle East uh, in far more, let's say, uh, uh, less schematized way. For example, Assassin's Creed, which recreated the, the medieval Damascus and, and, and Medina, and the game actually is kind of trying to, uh, you can play a hero, who is, who is, you can play a positive, positive, positive hero. There are also like uh, games like the Civilization series, which is probably the most famous one for very, I would say, nuanced representation of different world civilization. In particular, they, this game actually contains even like real world scenarios, like historical scenarios, which are, uh, uh, and it allows you to play different sides. So you can actually, in this game, you can play different civilizations and they are all procedurally equal. Like, so the rules are the same and they are all of them are, uh, there's like a huge encyclopedia in behind and they try to give you some, some background and some, some deeper understanding. Or even let's say, uh, like mainstream action games, which you know don't have like any kind of aspiracy to be you know educational or whatever, but these games like Overwatch actually is one of the first action games which offered uh, playable and positively portrayed Arab and Muslim characters. Uh, <clears throat> this actually, this the industry as a whole is is changing, and that's kind of thing which uh, it, we definitely can can witness. There was a famous talk by Osama Dorias, who is a video game developer of uh, Arab origin, and uh, it was a game. It was it was a talk at GDC, which is the large one of the largest developers' conference in San Francisco in 2018, and he actually delivered a highly critical acclaimed speech called uh, "How to Guide to Muslim Representation in Video Games," where he was kind of talking to his to his fellow his colleagues, to his fellows about like how. Uh, the stereotypes of, of Arabs, Muslims, or generally the Middle East can be harmful for the real people uh, playing games there. And 
I would say there are new people entering the industry, and there is definitely uh, what we can see. There is definitely more attention towards more nuanced and, and less schematized and less harmful representations. And then finally, there is a genre of what I would call critical games or serious game. This is a game, uh, Burn Me My Love, which is a game, uh, which is a game which uh, is based on on real story uh, of of, uh, of uh, refugees from the Syrian civil war, and the game is very emotional. Uh, it's uh, and the game actually you play it on a mobile phone, and you play a person who left um, uh, his, his his family. Uh, in in in, uh, in Syria and and went uh, to uh, on on the perilous road to Europe and the whole game is played on a mobile phone in a form of text messages. So you are actually kind of exchanging text messages with with with with, with your with your loved ones who stayed in Syria, and and it's so it's kind of like interactive narrative, and uh, the game actually can even happen in real time. So you're like waiting for a message and you don't know if the message will arrive or not. So it's again it's it's a it's a great example on how the procedure rhetoric of video games can be used for delivering very powerful and I would say very intimate intimate message. Then finally like towards the end the question does it even matter? Like it's even important to ask what is in the video games because they are games anyway, you know. Do, do so what is the kind of link between what we consume in video games and uh, and and uh, maybe what do you think about the world? So there is a growing body of research including uh, research of colleagues of mine and, and mine on, on, on video games and attitudes. So we kind of try to, uh, uh, try to discover if, if the way some, uh, some uh, content is framed in a video game, if, if it actually uh, can change your attitudes towards the depicted phenomena. And the, uh, the answer from the whole research is uh, probably yes. It seems that the, the, the results of the research indicate that actually games can change your attitude towards uh, towards what what they depict so there there might be a chill link between between racialized schematizations and for example Islamophobia there might be but on the other side to the positive side then actually we discovered a link between critical games and more for example more critical understanding of what is happening if uh, particularly the, the critical games can be particularly successful if they are based on on the, if they use narrative, if they are based on real personal stories, and if they use multi-perspectivity. So th this is something games can really do very well. They can present you different sides of the story, or they can present you the same situation from two different eyes. And uh, so there is kind of, I would say, uh, there is, yeah, uh, to end, like, it actually, I would say it matters, video games do matter, and I believe video games are actually a great medium, not only for entertainment, but also for telling the stories. And we as game developers actually, can make great games without without schematizing whole ethnic groups and religions. So thanks a lot for your attention and I'm ready to answer any questions. So now please Emir, you can come and thank you Vitz for this presentation. Uh, the QA session will be at the end of the panel. So if you have questions or you want to also share your ideas about this presentation. Please keep that for the end. So I will okay, thank you. Uh, so today I'll show you how video games uh, fit into the structure of an exhibition, actually. Uh, the exhibition uh, that took place in uh, 2021 in Para Museum. Uh, what Byzantinism is this in Istanbul? Uh, Byzantium in popular culture. So uh, I should briefly tell you about the exhibition and then I'll proceed with how the video games uh, enhance the overall narrative uh, the, of the exhibition uh, uh, and how it uh, helped it to convey the uh, arguments uh, that is uh, that, uh, that is within the exhibition, let's say. So, uh, what, what Byzantinism is this in Istanbul was designed to show the eclectic presence of and conflicting, uh, conflicting ideas on Byzantium in popular culture uh, with a purposeful layout where various artistic mediums were displayed alongside uh, each other under thematic titles. Uh, most of these thematic titles were organized around the tropes regarding Byzantium to be found in arts. So therefore, visitors to the exhibition encountered video games 
among other artistic mediums such as literature, music, cinema, etc. So the structure uh, allowed historicized and ideologically nuanced formation of tropes, uh, which related a story of uh, history, art, perception, and politics. Uh, so I should also clarify how we defined video games in arrange and the exhibition sections. Uh, so a video game uh, is a multiplicity of mediums, in fact. So it is an audiovisual narrative, as uh, <laughs> Witt also said, uh, audiovisual narrative that can be interacted with tactile, visual, and audio interfaces. So in addition, it has meta material uh, related to production processes uh, such as concept arts, uh, websites, or apps. So in displaying video games in an exhibition, uh, we opted for any of the material related to the given game. Uh, thus, in each case, we have benefited from various aspects of video games. So what and how we chose to show were partly dictated uh, by in what way Byzantium was represented in the game. Uh, as Marco Fasolio argued in his article in the edited volume uh, to the exhibition, uh, most video games that one way or another represent Byzantium uh, can be regarded as uh, quasi-Byzantinisms. Uh, he explained that Byzantium appears only because the context in which uh, the story of the game unravels necessitates uh, the presence of Byzantium. So another obligation on our part was that the exhibition's objective was to create a coherent, albeit internally conflicting, narrative on the reception of Byzantium by employing distinct artistic mediums. So for these reasons, it was impossible and meaningless uh, for, uh, for us to allow visitors to play uh, a whole or part of a game in the venue. So eventually, uh, we made use of concept arts, short clips, uh, gameplay uh, videos, cutscenes, and screenshots. So uh, in five out of nine sections uh, of the exhibition, uh, video games uh, were displayed along other materials uh, to present a whole. Uh, occasionally, parts of a single video game were displayed under different sections of the exhibition. Uh, Bu geri mi gidiyor? Ah, yok. Geri giden hangisi? Biraz geri alabilir misin? Tabii. Çok sağ <gülüyor> İki veya üç. İki tane daha. Geri. Şimdi üç. bir daha ile. Tamam. Tamam. Ee, tamam. No. Yok, bu iyi. Tamam. So, Okay, uh, let me explain uh, briefly how we formulated these tropes. Uh, the ones that you see on the top line, sailing to Byzantium, jewel, jewel of the world, riotous colors, clock and dagger, because all those games were uh, shown under, uh, I mean most of them under these titles, and uh, some you'll see uh, as we proceed. Uh, uh, this was, this tropes was a key for us to bring together distinct artistic mediums and also to create links among historiography and contemporary productions. Uh, we borrowed the idea of using tropes, uh, we uh, called them topoi, uh, uh, from Byzantine authors actually. So literary topoi were extensively employed by them in their attempt to capture the respected expertise uh, of the earlier authors. So Byzantine authors of all genres had conventional topo in their literary inventory and worked under customary uh, principles, aware of this traditional context when writing. So in designating these categories, uh, we attempted to grasp the interrelation uh, between modern production, the artistic productions, and historical sources or historiographies. Uh, although the relationship between historical knowledge and popular culture is not uh, restricted to uh, direct reference to uh, historiography and sources, uh, 
uh, I mean, such referentiality uh, certainly exists uh, too. Uh, so I want to start with a clear example how all these uh, worked together. So we named one section Jewel of the World. Uh, it is a designation frequently used to refer Byzantine Constantinople in Ottoman, Armenian and Byzantine sources. Uh, we encounter similar allusions in medieval European sources as well. Uh, so you see two examples here, I hope you can see. Uh, uh, uh, besides, uh, it's a common designation for Byzantine Constantinople in contemporary artistic productions. Uh, Moreover, in the exhibition, we use this, uh, let's say, title as an umbrella to include uh, several related themes regarding Constantinople. So the, these themes were eternality, centrality, and uh, exoticism and mysticism uh, assigned to the city. So Constantinople appears both to be admired for its splendor and richness, uh, and in a way, unknowable, for it is the container of magical and technical wonders, uh, a place that hides in its underground tunnels and palaces and churches. Uh, a glimpse into its secrets inspires both exhilaration and dread uh, in the uh, onlooker, let's say. Uh, so uh, here the examples are from uh, an Ottoman uh, po poet from 16th century uh, who uses the uh, term Kainatın uh, Revnakı, which is Jewel of the World in Ottoman. And another one uh, is an Armenian poem just after 1453, the conquest of, the, of Constantinople by the Ottomans. Uh, it's a eulogy uh, written for the uh, empire, for the city. And uh, in Armenian, uh, the city is also uh, called the Jewel of the, Jewel of the World. Uh, so, uh, in this section, we show the concept arts, for instance, illust uh, illustrated for Rise of the Tomb Raider, uh, a 2015 action-adventure game. Uh, this, you see the uh, concept art here. Uh, as this example shows, uh, Byzantium is not only represented in historical games, history games, uh, but in various genres. Uh, in this game, uh, the protagonist, Lara Croft, discovers a secret Byzantine city buried under mounds of Siberian snow. Uh, the city, founded by an exiled Byzantine heterodox faction, I suppose from 9th century, uh, houses Constantinopolitan architecture, as well as uh, mystical artifacts with magical properties that grant them eternal life. So they live there in present time uh, since the 9th century. Uh, okay, that's wrong. Uh, okay, no. Uh, so we juxtaposed uh, this, uh, this concept art, for instance, uh, uh, and its explanation, uh, with the material that represents uh, a mystic, eternal and splendorous Byzantium. Uh, for instance, the idea of splendor was present in the lyrics uh, of the song Conquest of Bosporus by The Conjured, uh, you see on the, uh, on the left. Uh, it's again a kind of a eulogy for the city, but uh, it's, uh, it also alludes to the uh, you know, this jewel quality of the city. Uh, or we see uh, the, ex the exotic technologies or magic uh, that is described in, uh, in the novel City of Saints and Madmen by Jeff Vandermeer, uh, which is actually a, a fantasy uh, fiction uh, and take place in a, a speculative a fictional city, which has too many allusions to uh, Constantinople uh, and Byzantium. So this kind of description of some uh, wondrous machines uh, are uh, almost uh, uh, analogously present in the in the uh, medieval accounts uh, to the uh, of the medieval uh, Western European travelers to the uh, Byzantine palace. Uh, so uh, 
in different mediums we showed how these ideas uh, work together. Uh, or uh, in this uh, digital illustration, uh, the eternal eternality of Constantinople was uh, present here in this uh, futuristic description uh, of Constantinople uh, by Max Bedulenko. Uh, so, rise of the Tomb Raider found its way into another section, sailing to Byzantium. Uh, where we toyed with the medieval travelers accounts of Constantinople and William Butler Yeats 1920s poem which was also a product inspired by medieval sources. So we, we detected the underlying thread among historical sources and contemporary productions to be a, a movement or gaze towards uh, or imagination of Constantinople. A non-Byzantine protagonist is a must here. Uh, and fascination with the multitude of domes, glitter, and splendor of the city. Uh, so visitors are amazed by the knowledge of being face to face with something uh, extraordinary. Uh, Blake, can you please uh, play the uh, clip? There is a play button. And the, oh, okay, thanks. It's just a short clip where uh, Lara Croft uh, discovers the part of the city, let's say, which is architecturally uh, very similar to a, a big Byzantine <laughs> city. The Chamber of Souls. The Divine Source has to be there. Looks like the way into the city center is through that gate. Thanks. So this troop uh, partly put a utopian light uh, to Constantinople. So in this instance, uh, where we put a sequence of this game, uh, as you see, uh, she is trying to unravel the mysteries of this hidden uh, city and found a splendorous uh, city with a very similar architectural uh, features to uh, Constantinople. Mm. So another example, uh, as you will see many examples from uh, this game to, uh, this evening. So another example uh, in, this, in this section was a, a concept art, uh, art done for a 2011 video game, uh, Assassin's Creed Revelations. So here the protagonist, a 16th century Italian adventurer, uh, is depicted to have arrived in Constantinople, this time uh, literally uh, by sailing. So the scene shows his fascination with the wonderful city. Uh, so these video game materials, uh, one gameplay sequence that you uh, just watched, and this concept art were, for instance, side by side with a quotation uh, from Robert, Robert Silverberg's uh, sci-fi novella from the 80s, uh, Sailing to Byzantium. Uh, okay. So the one up there, uh, so uh, where the, the traveler, uh, in fact, living in the future, uh, sails to uh, re a newly uh, constructed uh, a reenactment of Constantinople. And uh, the uh, author tells of protagonist, he thought he could almost make out the shape of the great city sprawling on its seven hills, Constantine's near Rome beside the Golden Horn, the mighty dome of Hagia Sophia, the somber walls of the citadel, the palaces and churches, the hippodrome, Christ in glory rising above all else in brilliant mosaic streaming with light. Uh, and you also see a similar attitude in, uh, in a page from Suat Yala's Karolan comic from 60s, uh, where a character got excited and say, what a nice, uh, uh, what a nice journey it will be to arrive in Byzantium and see wonders. Uh, he says it somewhere here. Oh, I have a yeah, it's okay. anyway. <laughs> so, um, so we displayed displayed two other parts of uh, Assassin's Creed Revelations in various locations. In one cutscene in the section called Cloak and Dagger. Uh, where, for better or worse, Byzantine politics is represented as, uh, as a violent domain, 
and the gameplay sequence in the section Hagia Sophia, the monument feminized, where we put footage of the game's protagonist exploring Hagia Sophia alongside quotations from conservative Turkish historical uh, novelists from 50s to 70s. Uh, can you play this scene as well? So here, again from Assassin's Creed, where uh, you know this idea of violent uh, politics going on, intrigue and uh, betrayal. So you see the Byzantine insurgent character collaborating with an Ottoman uh, commander uh, to, you know, take down uh, Ottoman powers and uh, rebuild uh, Byzantium in Constantinople. So this is the scene where our protagonist discovers the uh, Sheen scheme. So uh, this footage, for instance, uh, was in a loop uh, with another cutscene from uh, Total War Attila, where Belisarius, a 6th century uh, Byzantine commander, contemplates betraying the Emperor Justinian. Uh, so it's not a clip, but this is the uh, highlight of the situation. He, uh, the, you see the Emperor there and Belisarius on the left. Uh, he was tempted to betray him. So, if I briefly go back to uh, this uh, Hagia Sophia uh, section, uh, there is this Hagia Sophia, the monument fem feminized section in the exhibition, and there there is only two types of material there, which is uh, this video clip. Uh, it's actually a five minute long thing, but I put only a, a, a very brief uh, part. Can you play that? Uh, Oh, it's a still, sorry. Uh, in, in this uh, clip, the, again, the protagonist, uh, you know, uh, discovers, in, uh, I mean, managed to enter Hagia Sophia and discovers non-existent and hidden and secret uh, treasures there. So uh, this idea of Hagia Sophia uh, standing there for hundreds of years awaiting its capture to, you know, uh, reach its treasures uh, is present here and it was also present in the Turkish novels uh, from 50s to 70s uh, where you can see uh, the ideas of, you know, Hagia Sophia is uh, literally or metaphorically a, a woman uh, waiting hundreds of years to be captured uh, by uh, Ottomans, uh, so uh, I won't uh, read them, uh, so I'll continue. Uh, so finally, uh, in the section uh, Theodora, the woman monumentalized, uh, we juxtaposed the screenshot of Theodora from Civilization uh, 5, uh, I think it was from 2010, with uh, Benjamin Constant's painting from uh, 1887, uh, uh, the Empress Theodora at the Colosseum to explore the continuities and breaks in the representations of Empress Theodora. Uh, Civilization V uh, Theodora uh, on the right uh, shares a similar frame, uh, posture and color palette with Benjamin Constant's oil painting, albeit with essential diversions. Uh, in Constant's case, Theodora is in Rome on the left, particularly in Colosseum, and she is presented as a proverbial decadent and vain woman, whereas in Civilization uh, 5, Theodora is in Constantinople, uh, particularly in a balcony that alludes to Katizma in the Hippodrome. Uh, Hagia Sophia is in the background. So in addition to a more accurate representation of space uh, in the video game, uh, compare, uh, comparing to the uh, oil painting from 19th century. Uh, in contrast to Benjamin Constant's work, here she is in control of the empire and ruling it, uh, ruling the empire instead of Emperor Justinian. So in the uh, you know, interface, uh, while you are playing as a player, you 
how to negotiate uh, with uh, Theodora, not uh, Justine. So in conclusion, uh, bringing video games together with other artistic productions made many previously unknown connections visible and strengthened the argument to posit tropes in understanding the representations of Byzantium. Uh, as narrative mediums, uh, video games are also uh, in a referential uh, relation with historiography and themselves are historicized productions of which appropriations of history are shaped not independent, independent from their politics and their position in time. So before I finish, I just want to show you one last thing. Uh, so I will show this to stress that uh, appropriation of history is not exclusive to historical games, as we see in the example, of, as we saw in the example of Rise of the Tomb Raider, and to a certain extent, even in Assassin's Creed, uh, various genres, especially the speculative ones, such as fantasy and sci-fi, sci appropriate Byzant Byzantium in very creative and subtle ways. So in the exhibition, uh, the variety of genres, and especially the richness of speculative ones, was emphatically present in literary and visual mediums, but not so much in video games. So just to lay the ground for further work, I'd like to uh, mention this example. So we'll uh, see a video clip from Cyberpunk 2017, uh, which is a futuristic sci-fi game that uh, came out at the end of 2020 when I was working uh, on this exhibition and didn't have a chance to play at the time. So the game ends with an unexpected uh, reference to uh, William Butler Yeats' uh, poem uh, Sail into Byzantium. I mean, if I knew about that uh, by then, probably this would end up in the Jewel of the World section. Uh, so it quotes the poem in a way that binds Byzantine craftsmen's uh, work on automata, these wondrous uh, mechanical machines, and the overarching theme of the game, which is uh, crafting a better human for better or for worse. So can we uh, watch the clip and finish this? <laughs> Thanks. Emir and after seeing so many clips from the games I'm sure there are so many of us who wants to play these games now <laughs> okay so we will now have Tonye for her presentation I'm just stealing some water yeah sure um and I would like to start by uh, thanking the organizers and also my co-presenters. Um, I've thoroughly enjoyed your presentations and I'm really looking forward to our discussions afterwards. And um, I'm going to pick up on some of the same material that uh, Emmy had talked about. As you can see here, let's start with Theodora. This is Theodora, as he, Emmy said, from Civilization. Um, and when I have worked uh, on this game, I have come at it from the angle as an art historian. Um, how this one? This one? Here, I think. Yeah, just. Kind of. And so, of course, I've also made the connection to Jean Benjamin Constant's painting of Theodora. If you can just go on. 
and seen how the Theodora and the Civilization games is basically a mix of Constance, Theodora and the mosaic in Ravenna. And I have looked at this from a focus on what is usually called Byzantinism as it understood as in the depiction of something Byzantine in a manner which exaggerates and even at times vilifies that in a way that makes it seem as negative or decadent or overblown. And subsequently we often talk of Byzantinism as a way in that is similar to the term Orientalism. A term which for the last few decades have been mostly associated with the works of the scholar Edward Said. And I will return to Edward Said and Orientalism later. But I want to start first with sort of the work that I have been doing, but I've been sort of drawing a blank at it. And in the civilization uh, game, um, as many of you probably know, the player goes in, you are in a sort of a god mode uh, and you are the role of a supreme strategist and you can lead your civilization towards victory, which can include such fun things as actually, you know, allowing the Byzantines to conquer space, which um, is a kind of sort of like a fun, ahistorical thing to do. Um, and each civilization in the game is represented, again, as Amy said, by a specific leader. And uh, there are various Byzantine leaders represented in the various iterations of the game. But I do think that this form of uh, depiction of Theodora is, is quite... Um, it's the one that has been most referenced in Byzantine reception studies. And I think it's quite evident why, because it's sort of taken Benjamin Constant and mixed it with the Ravenna mosaic and turned it into the sort of femme fatale that when you, if you don't play her, you can meet her as the sort of AI control antagonist in the game. And then she will greet you in new Greek and say, well, welcome friend and she will be like very seductive and she will lounge forward and you think this is really not the way a Byzantine empress would probably uh, act but still it's almost like a caricature in a way and I've gone on from that and I thought okay so this is one example of Byzantine representation in games and um, then if we could just go on uh, then I've also looked at uh, Assassin's Creed Revelations. <coughs> um, now, the Byzantine Empire is never the main setting for an Assassin's Creed game. The references to Byzantium is to be found throughout the games. I was quite nerdy when I was playing Assassin's Creed Valhalla and I could collect Byzantine armor. That was fun for me. Uh, but the game where sort of references to Byzantium features the most is, as mentioned, Assassin's Creed Revelation, which is the third in a, tri a trilogy of games that features uh, Ezio the Auditore, who you see here. And he has come to Ottoman Constantinople, where he teams up with the very charming Ottoman assassins, uh, to thwart the antagonistic Templars, who are sometimes also called the Byzantine Templars. So the sort of historical anachronisms just keep coming. And one of the main antagonists he opposes is, uh, as shown in the clip that Emé has shown, a man called Manuel Paleologos, who is presented in the game as the last sort of uh, surviving heir of the Byzantine empirical throne and he is trying through a plot to take back the empire and revive the Byzantine empire and at the close of this game and I'm going to spoil part of the end of revelations here you track down Manuel Paleologos if you just continue um, you track him down to a large, dark, and smoky cave in Cappadocia with the goal of assassinating him and putting an end to his schemes. However, when you find him in this dark and dungy cave, it's revealed that this cave uh, contains not only Paleologos and his soldiers, but it's also the site of a rather ramshackle village. 
uh, full of mud huts and wooden walkways inhabited by people who call themselves the Byzantines. And the games make it clear that these are the remnants of the Byzantine Empire that have sort of sought refuge in this cave in Cappadocia. We never explained how they got there, but, but still. Well, you as a player manage to assassinate Manuel Paleologos. In fact, it's not particularly difficult to do so because he is the only character in the whole game who is presented as rather fat uh, and um, uh, he wears sumptuous clothing and he presents himself in an effeminate way. And all this sort of ensures that he's quite easy to track chase down in the gameplay and then assassinate him. And so I would say he is very much a character that is in the line with this idea of the decadent Byzantine emperor or even the sort of the oriental uh, potentate trope. And he even has a rather inglorious death where he wails, we are the Byzantines, and then he dies. And uh, during the fight, you manage to ignite the, uh, some hay around the village, and this whole village and the cave burns down. And it sort of ends with this rather feeling that that was a good thing, because these people who lived in the cave had a rather sad life, and so it's, it's fairly OK that you're sort of ending the Byzantine Empire there then. <laughs> And as I was playing this game, and I was thinking about back to this whole Theodora as the seductress thing, and I was thinking, this is annoying me. And not just because it's a stereotype, but because it's a boring stereotype. I mean, there is no, there is no sort of challenge or, in, or uh, you're not challenged with any new ideas or new thoughts here. You're just using the shorthands of the stereotypes, and that is frankly just lazy storytelling. And that is part of what I've sort of struggled with this material and that I sort of want to think of today when it comes to Edward Said, when it comes to Orientalism, and when it comes to otherness. Because why does it matter if a story is boring or stereotypical? Well, I would say it matters because the potential to do something else is so great. The possibility to imagine and to play with and to create and to, through doing that, to expand our understanding of the world and history. Now, this might seem a lot to put the weight on, for instance, Assassin's Creed Revelations to do that. Yet, I will try to explain why I feel it is a possible sort of perspective to take. And I will do that through a reflection on the sort of the interaction of gameplay and world building in the game. And through that, I will move on to the aforementioned Edward Said and what he calls imaginative geographies and the creation of otherness, and try to see if imaginative geographies and otherness, if we go at it from a play perspective, cannot be strictly just negative, but actually being something that can be positive and create empathy as well. Now, Assassin's Creed Revelation was released in 2011 and it was the fourth game in the Assassin's Creed franchise and that, in other words, it was already a fairly established, hugely popular game franchise. And it was, uh, as mentioned, the setting was primarily Constantinople. So if we'll just skip forward. Now, a central feature, and everyone who has played Assassin's Creed knows this, but I'm just going to assume that some people haven't. You should, but, but still. A central uh, feature of the gameplay of Assassin's Creed is that you are uh, able to climb and scale buildings. You jump across rooftops, and you parkour down walls to complete your goal. 
And one of the highlights for me was actually the quest where I was required to climb the walls of the Hagia Sophia. And in fact, I found it so much fun and so engaging that I didn't really mind all that much that I actually fell down on my first try and died. And this centrality of movement and interaction with the game world, I think, is a vital part of what makes the Assassin's Creed game so fun. And I think it's also a central part of what creates the sort of an engagement and immersion with the world building of the game. Now, I know I am not the only player who loves climbing and exploration in Assassin's Creed franchise. Because if you go on YouTube or similar sites, there are tons of videos there uh, where players show and explore the various settings. And instead of completing this or that quest, they have paused to look at sunsets or particular sites or to document particular buildings. The results can often, I think, be quite stunning. Often the videos of these journeys are accompanied either by the sweeping game music or by songs and music that the, the poster feels, the you know, person who has uploaded feels is uh, appropriate to convey the mood. Thus is created what can possibly be described as a form of sightseeing documentary of a past city. Um, and the various of the various Assassin's Creed worlds. And while such videos exist side by side with other more tr sort of traditional game videos, uh, such as walkthroughs, lists of the best weapons in gear, etc., I am fascinated as an art historian by how popular it is to simply explore and experience the game world, its architecture, its cities, and its sort of the moods of the place. And I would say that, that this popularity when it comes to Assassin's Creed is of course also because it's, you are able to climb, you're able to interact with this world in a way that makes it feel uh, alive to you. You can, you can move as easily vertically as you can horizontally and you don't have to rely on, for instance, uh, ropes or ladders and you develop even what some people refer to as the sort of Assassin's Creed syndrome where you, when you don't play the game and you go out in the real world and you see a building and you start to think well if I jump from that window to there to so to so then I can get up on the roof right so it, it sort of engages you to think of space in uh, a very specific way And to explain why this matters to me, why I've been sort of stuck on this, I need to make a quick stop into the philosophy of aesthetics. Now, aesthetics, which comes from the word, uh, the Greek word, aesthesis, is often translated to mean beautiful, and we often say that something beautiful is aesthetically pleasing. However, aesthetic philosophy is not only about beauty, but rather it is about the senses. In other words, it's about sight and sound and smell and touch. And it is an exploration about how we as humans experience the world through our senses. And for the aesthetic philosophers, art is important in a large part because it appeals directly to our senses and allows us to engage with our sense within relatively controlled environments. To exemplify, people in the 19th century wanted to explore what they called the sublime. By this they meant a feeling of awe and even existential dread. Some very few people sought out the sublime in specifically dangerous places, such as the high highest mountain peaks or the deepest caves. And there, with the threat of death imminent, they would have extremely heightened experiences. They would be extremely aware of their senses, they would report that they felt incredibly alive and so forth, and such experiences were often called the sublime. However, not everyone. In fact, the vast majority of people um, did not want to have real death experiences, and so they sought out the same emotions via art. 
And in the early 19th century, art that depicted landscapes just such as wild, ragged mountains or roaring waterfalls were a way that people felt that they could explore the sublime without being threatened. Within aesthetic philosophy, there isn't necessarily a difference in quality between the ways of experiencing the sublime. It is not in the endless ideas of philosophy seen that climbing an actual physical mountain is seen as automatically better than viewing a mountain. In fact, many aesthetic philosophers would pro probably argue that it's better to experience it through art because Art has the power to create, to exaggerate, and thus, thus to amplify the height of the mountains or the particular beauty of a place or the sight of a waterfall. And thus, the philosophers argue, art might actually make you feel more than what experiencing something in real life would. Now, the reason that art can do that in the first place is because of the feelings of engagement and immersion interacting with art can create in us. So, what does this have to do with Assassin's Creed Revelation and my joy being able to climb on rooftops in old Constantinople? Well, I would argue that just as the paintings of the 19th century could create in us feelings of immersion and experience, then so too can games like Revelation. The experience of guiding the player characters over rooftops and up to towers while pausing to look at the sunrise is an engagement of our senses. It's an aesthetic experience that can, though it doesn't have to, and uh, make us reflect on what we are seeing and how we are feeling. However, whereas the painters of the 19th century sought to find the sublime in nature, a game like Revelation is much more focused on history. So what I'm wondering is in that sense, can it be said to a game like this to allow us to experience a form of historical sublime? to experience an approximation of how the sunset looked over the towers and minarets of Constantinople in the 16th century. Now, the obvious caveat here to my sort of positive, can the game transport us and make us feel things, is of course the aforementioned already um, quoted examples of how a game like Revelation is neither historically correct nor authentic in that it shows it how exactly as it was. And the example of the, the rather stereotypical depiction of Manuel Paleologos, I think, is proof enough of that. And such redonistic depictions should, of course, be engaged with critically. However, simply pointing out that such depictions are wrong is only the first step. It's also necessary to balance it against what is positive, I think. In regards to Assassin's Creed revelations, I would argue that the expe ex aesthetic experience of discovery is key. The game creates a world in which you as a player can interact with the structures depicted and immerse yourself in the feeling and atmosphere the game creates. And the world has its own geography that you as a player can learn to navigate. And engaging with this world creates sensation in us as players, evident in, for instance, how this this game landscape can come to seem familiar even though it does not actually exist in real life. And if we then follow through with the ideas of aesthetic philosophy, these aesthetic experiences can ensure that we sense and reflect on situations and experiences that we normally would not have. So basically it can expand our borders in, a, in the case of a game like Revelations, it can also make us relate to history and historical settings. And I would say that these sort of features of engagement and immersion are not just exclusive to Revelation, as I've argued, but they can find in most forms of art. So art, in other words, and I'm including games here in the sort of the big thing called art, has the potential to engage us in the unknown or even the imaginative. And this is where I come back to Edward Said. Now, Edward Said was well aware of uh, 
the power of the imaginative. In his work, Orientalism, he places great focus on what he called imaginative geography. And he used this term when he referred to a particular way of ascribing meaning to geography on the basis of cultural tropes in the terms of binary oppositions, such as the proposed dichotomy between East and West. Said's point was that this imaginative geography can be used to ascribe and contain numerous layers of ideological baggage and serve to legitimize particular worldviews. And that one of the ways it works is that it blends fact with fiction to create this entertaining stereotypical package. And I think he's completely correct in that. And he, of course, used this as a way to analyze and look into how imperial and colonial powers, particularly France and Britain, had defined the people they colonized as others, othered for, from themselves as a way to legitimize colonization. And so in Said's terms, being defined as othered is clearly a negative thing. And I would think that the depictions of Manuel Paleologos can clearly be read as a depiction of a character that is othered in a negative way. However, what I'm wondering and what I want to sort of propose here, and I must make the caveat that this is not this is still very much like a thought process in my head. If it is possible through sort of the imaginative worlds of games and the interactions we have through art to create other worlds, other places, other ideas that can also be considered as a form of positive othering. A depiction of something that differs from the world in which we, find we are situated and which presents us with and notably makes us emotionally engage with a different world view. And in my opinion, games like Assassin's Creed Revelation has the potential for such positive othering through its emphasis on world building and play. I would say it's already there when people like engage with the sites and engage with the architecture. And I would say that since we are here in, in a science fiction library, I think that is also one of the sort of the, the potentials of science fiction and fantasy is to create other worlds that we can use as imagining other possible versions of the world. And one of the things that I find so fascinating with uh, a game like then Assassin's Creed is that it then takes these historical aspects and it blends them with fiction in a way that makes us emotionally engaged with history and which makes us rethink the possibilities of engaging with history. And I think when that is a possibility in a game, I think it is so extra sad that some parts of it, like the Manuel Paleologos character, then goes down the sort of the classical stereotypical par path, because the potentiality is so much greater than what is already there. So, thank you. So thank you very much, Tonya. So uh, can we have please all of our uh, panelists here uh, for the Q&A session? Uh, so uh, in this session, I will have a few questions for the panelists. And especially, I want to ask some things that can link the uh, talks together. But that won't be that much. And after that, we will receive your questions also. Uh, so my first question actually for Wit, uh, I was very curious about this um, this rhetoric of play the news, about this uh, games in which we see war technologies and in which like actually these games, we know that this industry, military and entertainment complex are quite um, powerful in the mm. 
production of these games. So, but you also mentioned uh, these games, these critical games, which are also very um, interesting for many of us, I believe. So, what do you think about the political context that influenced the production of this kind of uh, games? Because actually, we are also seeing for many, many years the rise of this populist right in the uh, worldwide. So uh, what do you think about the possibility of the production of this kind of critical games in the following years? Yeah, well, I, I think that's one important thing which is kind of clear from the broad range of the presentation is that when we talk about video games, we oftentimes, or maybe especially in popular discourse, oftentimes video games are kind of one label. It's like kind of, as, as it is a homogeneous entity. But in reality, actually, the only thing which uh, connects what, what, you, what are modern video games is that we play them on a screen and they are typically like uh, they execute rules by, by computer but they come from very different routes uh, and from like so like for for example the war games and uh, and uh, strategic military games they they are like linked to uh, to to war simulations and to actually for example to to kriegspiel which is a prussian Prussian game, which was used for training the, the Prussian army, mm -hmm. and but the, on the other hand, you have like these narrative games or uh, role-playing games, which are actually pretty much linked to AD&D, uh, the uh, Dungeons and Dragons, mm -hmm. and then to Tolkien's narrative and then to Edda and Kalevala, etc., etc. So, and the, the the fact that all these like really different things uh, are now played on screen doesn't does kind of like doesn't um, uh, doesn't detach them from the discourse and from the roots of their origin. And the military games, uh, especially, especially the first person shooter, they oftentimes, even though they might not be perceived as, they actually, they actually originate in, I would say, a political environment uh, already, because um, they are typically, um, they are kind of very close links between military and the, uh, the, the video game industry. And typically what you can see, typically many, many game companies actually, uh, or armies actually use simulators and game-like experiences to train soldiers. So there's a like close link between the game companies and, and military. And at the same time, actually, especially in the games of the first person shooters I was talking about, why there is a lot of like focus on the technology, on the topography and on the like combat kind of uh, combat uh, yeah, experiences is that many, of, many times uh, uh, retired military officers actually find their second career in a video game industry mm -hmm. and they work as consultants. Uh, to kind of to kind of make sure that all these details are, are right, so I would I, I would say <laughs> thinking uh, of uh, video games uh, that you can't detach their production and through like away from the broader surrounding context, which is political and so everything else, and the critical games uh, on the other hand, they typically like stem from r r really different sources, uh, um, and oftentimes they, from what I've seen and from the research we've done, it seems that most of the what we call critical or documentary games are uh, using narrative as kind of a key vehicle as key vehicle to deliver some message especially if they deal with the micro level so human experiences for example of war displacement and, and political crisis so uh, and oftentimes they are much more uh, linked to document like docu I, I sometimes label them documentary games even though the characters they uh, depict are fictions. They are in many cases based on real experiences or they like, they're like fictions assemblage of real stories. They take real several real stories and they mm, put them into character. And um, so I would say that that's kind of like, uh, I, I see there's a potential for both. Uh, and both are political in a way that, you know, like uh, everything you, every kind of production uh, m might, be, might be political. But uh, they uh, they simply they simply originate in, in f completely different different fields. Okay, okay. thank you. So uh, another question for Emir. So uh, actually, it was an idea that came to my mind with the talk of Witt uh, when he talked about how he played uh, this NATO commander uh, in his childhood, and we also had this kind of games in which actually uh, we were experiencing something in which we were the enemy. Mm -hmm. So uh, how do you think about it when you were uh, playing from one side and also working on this exhibition actually? Did you feel anything like this self-orientalism or the dangers of that? I mean, I used to feel that uh, the similar thing when I was playing those strategy games like Age of Empires or Total War. Uh, I mean, it was kind of an ongoing joke among uh, our friends. Uh, the 
persons who can uh, choose uh, Byzantium, for instance, uh, in total war, were more uh, cooler than the others because they didn't care about these, you know, nationalistic ties and stuff. So uh, it was kind of a competition among us who can uh, play with uh, further uh, culture than uh, some people were like, okay, I don't care about anything here, so I play with Franks and stuff. <laughs> so, uh, but while arranging the exhibition, uh, the problem was you know these tropes this topoi uh, can be easily understood as cliches too we had to uh, somehow convey that th those are not cliches but there are many ideological nuances uh, it depends on the creators and how we play with them so uh, it was i mean we had tried to balance to uh, you know show difficult different angles uh, but then again it's it depends on who plays uh, what so uh, I mean uh, after a certain point there's nothing you can do about it uh, I mean as as someone who you know gather those assembly those uh, games uh, so I, I'm not sure if it's an answer but I am confused about that too, <laughs> so it's a difficult thing that we have to deal. But th uh, if I felt self-orient, self-oriental, uh, uh, while you know putting Manuel Polarla goes mm -hmm. depicted as that stereotypical bad person mm -hmm. uh, and weak, yeah, that is interesting. I, was I, I I mean, did I identify myself with Manuel? Or Ezio, or Ottomans. Yeah. I mean, I mean, uh, while I was playing, I was really immersed into the character of Ezio. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but maybe because I was studying Byzantine history, I was also frustrated with uh, what you uh, what you see about Byzantium. And I can totally relate to your feelings when you you were describing the you know destruction of the village in Cappadocia. Yeah. I mean that. That, that is, you know, war crime, so, <laughs> so that's what I can say about it. Okay, okay, thank you. And um, I will have a question for Tonya also about this uh, aesthetic philosophy that you talked about. Mm. Uh, it is quite interesting also to think that, like, it's not always the experience who will be much more influencing for you. Maybe sometimes this exploration through mm. art can be more powerful for you, so that mm. was quite interesting and when thinking this with this video games I have this question like uh, engagement is really strong in this video games when we are playing so and sometimes we can see some um, escape feeling from mm. this engagement also for example uh, there are so many videos in YouTube or like uh, literally also you can just sit by a friend who is uh, mm. playing and just watching it how do you um, think about it, like this um, this need to escape sometimes from this engagement with video games? What do you think about this? Maybe too much uh, mm. feeling, too much mm. engagement? Yeah, that's that's a really interesting uh, a question. I, and I do think it, it can sometimes be that you, you sort of need a break because mm -hmm. you're too immersed, you, you become upset. Uh, and I always think it's fascinating how one of the sort of general complaints about video games is if the load screen takes too long because what the load screen does is it gives you a break whether you want mm -hmm. to or not. So it's sort of cutting you off from that immersion. And sometimes that can be a good thing, like after, for instance, a very, very like epic fight or anything like that, or you need to breathe. But other times you're like, in the middle of it and the load screen comes up and you're like oh. <laughs> like that uh, but I think it's so fascinating because for me video games show so clearly the sort of the, the central point in aesthetic philosophy is that we can engage with something even when we know it is fiction mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be like real it can play with being real like Assassin's Creed does 
but also, as Emin mentioned, I mean, Assassin's Creed has all of these sort of mumbo jumbo sacred holy objects and things like that. So it's evidently, it's fantasy. Uh, but still, just like the aesthetic philosophers say, we engage with it. And I think that through that engagement, there is so much potential for imagining other worlds and other possibilities that then, can then become wasted if we just go down like the manual paleologa stereotypical way. And um, I was also really fascinated uh, by Witt's talk about how some of these games, like for instance the, the game with refugee camp, like things like that, it, it can give you that engagement that can create empathy for something which is sort of outside of perhaps your personal experience. And I think that is really, really, it's a really powerful potential. So yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I still have some questions, but I will stop here and uh, turn to you. I see someone who wants to ask something. Uh, so I was one short question uh, to uh, Tony Yan also uh, want to add something uh, to both of you, to Emre as well. Um, um, one month ago, um, they also added uh, Theodora to Civilization VI, and uh, there's also Basil II, and uh, those two can uh, be looked as well, can be worth looking. And my question is short, by the way. You have told a lot about uh, video game experiences and how it can uh, brought someone into another world and uh, how it can affect uh, someone's feelings or uh, experience, uh, his experience about the game, but the game's world. Uh, have you played uh, Red Dead Redemption 2? Because in my opinion, and probably the majority of uh, players, uh, you don't get more art than that in video games. You don't get more, uh, like, if you want to feel the 19th century experience, uh, you don't get more than that. So I think, and I saw that you are interested in that, so I just wanted to add that and uh, ask that. Well, thank you. Thank I you very much. Recommend it. Yeah, I started playing that, but that was too long, and <laughs> I spent like half an hour arranging my shirt and getting a new hat. <laughs> that, that, then in a bar fight, it was all gone to bed, so I was in a mud, so I quit. <laughs> so that's just the start. The start is completely wild west, and then you get to see uh, more cities and uh, complete understanding of the 19th century Americans. I get, I get the point about the immersion. I mean, yeah. you, you, know, you are looking after your clothes and, yeah. <laughs> and then you are in a bar. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, thank you very much. I, I haven't played the, the uh, edition with the new Theodora, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm looking forward to that. And I'm also <coughs> wanting to play uh, Red Dead Redemption, but uh, it's a question of time. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> thank you. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, thank you, the experts, for c coming here. Uh, I personally thank you, people. So, my question is to our dear experts, all three dear experts, is that as a historian who works on war and military history, I do also love playing video games and. Um, during gameplay and after gameplay, I always like th there's a question that pinches my mind, bits by bits my mind that um, why game developers or designers are evading or tend to evade the historical accuracy or realism in video games, which is interesting because the 
realism and historical accuracy, especially in games that are involving military, war, and etc., it is something that offered by the many companies, developers, and um, as I say, designers. Uh, it is offered, but tend to be evaded or not included entirely or accurately. So I would like to ask you, the experts, why uh, this happens. And if I may give an example, uh, a more recent-ish example, the Hearts of Iron 4 and Battlefield 1 can be um, like looked into as fine examples to that. And the games later came after those. If you if you don't mind, yeah. actually that's that's a, that's a good question, and I, I I can't I don't think we have the answer because we can't talk you know for all the developers. But what I what I think there are several factors in play. Um, uh, one which is um, I would say uh, one is economical. Um, uh, that that is uh, actually like making a video game is a very risky business, and and it it it, it costs if you, if you make if you if you are developing a triple A game. It really costs a lot. It can be the same amount of block, like Hollywood blockbusters, maybe even more. And you have a lot of like uh, investors involved, you know, uh, and, and risk. So you want to make sure, as, as as possible, that the game will be commercially successful. So there is actually not much space for experiment uh, if, if if you're running a video game company, because if if you spend huge amount of money, for, you got from the investors, you kind of make sure at, at, at, at that like that. Uh, at least that money will come back. So you actually try to, if something worked uh, with the audience, you're not you're, you're not trying to do something else because that worked. Also, uh, also like by true experience and you know, testing etc., you kind of know what uh, what might be the things which will be m like great for marketing and and which which maybe you think the audience wants. And I would say uh, same amount of money you spend on on graphics. On better graphics than your than your competition on the market will yield you better chance to be successful than the same amount of money spent on historians and consultants, because simply that's you know because the, the graphics and the and the um, the yeah the the the, the the the the realism of the physical models and the the realism of, of kind of yeah the, the the weapons and war is may, may, maybe sells or, or at least like in experience sells more probably or that this would you know. Uh, uh, you think that then then the same money spent on uh, let's say the authenticity of the everyday life because th that's not why people you know buy these games and th that's not what they expect. At the same time, has to be said that and that's uh, that's what, why I would say you can see far more interesting uh, experiments uh, which are really like trying to, uh, to to to cross the boundaries and do something different in the indie scene. In, in the in independent game development scene, because simply they have space for exp for for experiments, because there is not that huge amount of money involved, etc., uh, etc. Et um, but at the same time, it has to be said, there are actually games which I would say uh, are mainstream and were massively commercially successful, and at the same time uh, are not schematizing or trivializing or they are not following the same the same blueprints and and this might be like just uh, just uh, um, exception exceptions but they are for example this war of mine you know it's, it's this war of mine is a game it's a it's kind of a, a strategy game where you take care of uh, survivals in a, in a city torn by civil war and the game is loosely like claim like it's, it's not uh, based on particular conflict but it's like they were loosely inspired by the siege of Sarajevo and the game was a commercial hit at the same time, it deviated a lot from the typical representation of war in video games because it presents war through uh, the civilian of victims and and and and and uh, and, uh, and uh, yeah, through perspective of civilians and victims. And then, for example, I would say there's one game, Black um, Spec Ops: the, the Line, which is a really interesting game. Which, unlike unlike many other games in uh, in the first-person shooter war genre, doesn't uh, sh doesn't shy away from depicting uh, civilian casualties and trauma and even the PTSD, the post-traumatic syndrome. Uh, but I would say that this game was kind of exception, with, which happened at a specific time where investors were willing were willing to invest money into some something which in the FPS genre was as as experimental as that. But I would say the main uh, reasons are structural and economic that you d simply don't uh, you don't um, need to, you, you don't dare to risk because there's too much at stake. Yeah. 
Can I add something to I that? I just want to add yeah. a very little thing. Uh, I think the answer works uh, for uh, the movie industry. I think there was a uh, discussion between... Uh, what was the scientist? Shane of the Lake with the uh, Oliver. Uh, CI with... Uh, Night uh, Night uh, uh, uh, yeah, uh, there's a discussion between uh, the maker of uh, Titanic and uh, Nile de Gr Tyson. Tyson. Tyson. Tyson. Tyson. Tyson. Tyson. Uh, Tyson. <laughs> and the movie maker said. Uh, yeah. Uh, the movie maker said uh, there won't be any difference uh, if I made uh, astronomic mistakes or not. So mm. they don't have to care, right? Yeah. yeah. Same mm. applies. Yeah, I, I'd like to add something related to that. So the uh, goal of accuracy is, you know, uh, related to the audience. So general audience is the uh, the real audience here. So if you are an expert on something, of course you can catch something. But uh, you know, accuracy and authenticity authenticity are different things, and you can create authenticity okay. by, you know. Uh, being picky, being eclectic about you know accurate and real uh, things. Uh, so, uh, from what I saw from the interviews uh, they did with to uh, Rise of the Tomb Raider team and uh, Assassin's Creed team, they actually uh, came as tourists, tourists to Istanbul and Cappadocia, and uh, just spent a, a week there. Uh, to learn some general ideas, mm -hmm. and that is good for uh, the general audience. I mean, I remember uh, in high school, uh, the historical knowledge in uh, Age of Empires II was sufficient enough for Turkish uh, high schools. <laughs> so, uh, it, I mean, it depends on the audience, and you are not, uh, you know, uh, you are not always aiming for the simulator or for you are not writing an uh, academic paper, mm. something like that. I can I also say. add this topic. <laughs> I'm a historian graduate, although I don't consider myself as a historian, but I'm a teaching assistant at the Department of Archaeology and History of Arts. But my major is uh, for master's degrees, museum studies and cultural heritage. But right now, I'm working for a game design company as a concept for those historical <laughs> games. And um, um, but I'm, because since I'm also a museum creator, that's my actual main job, mm. and I'm really sensitive on ethical mm. these issues, because the collections that I'm working on, the, they have human remains and sometimes mm. ethically weird objects that you, we need to be really considerate. Mm. So for game design, I'm also very sensitive with ethical subjects. So I do not want to include this kind of war things, and I... I, I think I had one week of meetings with the managers and the, that's all the game developers and designers to why we shouldn't implement those things. Like I spoke about the colonization, I spoke about like <coughs> ethical things, I spoke about like, um, you know, ra racist identity, that nationalism all around the world. And they kind of agreed on it. And at some point, we're kind of focusing on it's an RPG game that hasn't been published, hasn't been launched, but um, it's kind of like focusing on daily lives of normal people that focusing on rather than protecting the culture. That's mm -hmm. how I approach to a game design. So I think when I first heard the game managers, but that's what the general audience want, how I market my own concepts was that, but everybody is doing the same thing. We can do something else. We can do something else. And that's how they sparked it. So I don't know will it be successful or not when it was when it's going to be launched. But that's how I approach my work as a game designer right now. So it can be done, <laughs> I believe. Yeah, if I can like real last sentence to that, I actually think that the the, the it's the, the market is changing because you have like new like generation of people for, who played games as kids now are you know adults and s many of them actually still want to play games yeah. but are not satisfied with the simplified content so they kind of seek for more let's say major and major I mean in in terms of it's like kind of yeah more deeper stories and more 
yeah, for, for example, a real stories, and I would say real, real stories and real historical details, real history, can actually make a great game. Mm -hmm. So like, uh, so it, it, which, which, which can be from gameplay perspective and from maybe from narrative perspective, actually even more interesting than the stereotypes and cliches. So I, I would say there is definitely a space on the market for that. It's a question how big it is. I mean, since you mentioned that, uh, I didn't myself uh, try that, but apparently, uh, Assassin's Creed Odyssey, one of the last installments of the series, uh, has an education module mm -hmm. in it. Yep. So uh, apparently, and I heard good things about that. Never tried myself, but so apparently there are some uh, ambition on that part. Really. Yeah, and I mean, uh, speaking of uh, Assassin's Creed Odyssey, I I know classicists in at university actually use clips from that game. Mm -hmm to show to students, to get them to engage with the material. Uh, so I definitely think there are possibilities. And just to sort of loop back to, to um, war and depiction in games and, and also to film, there was this uh, American film director, Samuel Fuller. He had been a soldier in the Second World War. And he was said that you can never make an authentic war film unless you have people with guns shooting at the audience. So he basically said it's it's not possible because you can you can create a simulation, but you cannot get the sort of existential dread. You can't get the fear of death there. So let's try to do something else. I think was his point. Yeah. Um, I was like. Um, Nice time to traffic here, uh, yeah. but uh, maybe he's mentioned. But the legendary game designer Sandy Peterson, um, he's uh, behind the Age of Empires historical accuracy. He, he insisted on that um, throughout the Age of Conquerors, the Age of Kings era. And um, he, in an interview, he said, um, Guys from Microsoft came when the first patch was about to arrive, and they wanted to add Koreans. So why Koreans is it's not uh, accurate. It's not in our patch. Uh, mm. Our patch is about the um, you know Italians, uh, etc., mm. Venetians, Gen mm. Genoese, etc. So they they said basically uh, the game is adopted in Korea, and we need to sell more <laughs> in Korea. And <laughs> but these things change, right? Um, the same Microsoft. Um, heard the complaints about the historical accuracy in Age of Empires um, about Indians and split the Indian civilization to four um, okay. sub-civilizations uh, mm -hmm. like Gujaras, mm -hmm. Bengalis, etc. Mm -hmm. So I think the, uh, the uh, things are changing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like it's not um, uh, like 20 years ago. It, uh, do you agree? Um, it, any other examples maybe we can comment on that. Yeah, that's actually a very good point that oftentimes what I was actually showing like uh, it was kind of like condensed history of you know 20 years of video game development and schematizations of the Middle East I think what is changing is two things are important and one I mentioned that there are more and more actually there is a growing diversity inside the video game industry you know, as it is getting globalized, you have now like graphic programmers, designers coming from all the world, you know, working together in teams. And they actually bring the kind of like different view different viewpoints. And the other thing which is changing is are the consumers, that you actually are growing markets. And for example, the Middle East is actually quite a huge and growing, fast rapidly growing market for, for, for, for video games. So that actually, and this kind of like can make changes in the way things are depicted because, because you have a different consumer base in your, in, your, in your mind, which, which of course will, would demand more proper and less schematized representations of you know, their culture and, and, and etc. And just to play up on that, I think you can already see that change happening in things like science fiction and fantasy writing and mm -hmm. in uh, board games and role play where there aren't that much, that, that much money involved so they can alter quicker in a way. Because there has been like a huge uh, influx in the last few decades with like science fiction and fantasy stories that purposefully avoid the sort of the Tolkien tradition of Western European medieval blah blah blah blah, and instead go like no we want to see this from like a futuristic Chinese version mm -hmm. or things like that. So I do think yeah there is 
uh, a change happening. It's just that I think Vet is quite right in that the money involved in gaming makes changing <laughs> changes uh, slow and difficult. Any questions from the audience? Sure. I would like to ask Vit uh, um, uh, Through your presentation, you dem uh, demonstrated some examples about stereotypes in games. Uh, your example was direct stereotypes, which are obvious to understand uh, where it was originated. However, in fantasy role-playing games, uh, for example, World of Warcraft or Dungeons and Dragons, um, I personally experienced, it experienced that there were different races as associated with real culture. Uh, also, it is common that orcs and goblins were settled in, in, in the east, and while high elves uh, settled in the northwest uh, highland forest. forest. Uh, I'm aware that sometimes it is necessi necessary to use stereotype at some point as a narrator. Even I sometimes doesn't sense that I was using stereotypes. However, when I sense, I smooth it. So do you find this approach in fantasy role playing uh, games ethic? And can we assume this approach in fantasy role playing games as, as stereotypes? Or it is, is it something narratives, narratives do unintentionally? Yeah, OK. That, that's actually a good question. And I, I should, there's a huge debate out there about Tolkien and racial racial uh, racial uh, representation, which I don't think actually want to indulge into because I don't know, you know, it's like, like simply this. Uh, but I would say what is what is more interesting for me is the, I, I mean I love Tolkien, you know, I, I love Tolkien uh, uh, and, and his and his work, but it's uh, you know clearly stemming from very uh, easily identified source, which is you know which which is the Nordic and Anglo-Saxon mythology like Edda and Kalevala, and you can s sometimes even see like like direct uh, appropriations, mm -hmm. the names of the dwarves, and you know like uh, and and the, ru the runes and everything, uh, and <clears throat> for me. Um, and also, we can kind of clearly speculate because Tolkien was a was a professor of linguistics. And when you see the, the way he constructed different languages, you can see you know the, the Elven language is constructed in a different way than, for example, the Orc language. And you can you can make guesses about which kind of real languages in, like inspired him to to to what. Which uh, he, he's, I, think, I think he firmly denied any, any racial connotations in his work. But of course, you know you can you can you can you can uh, speculate. What is there, and sometimes you can you can see kind of a lot of uh, real inspiration. Uh, at the same time, I truly love uh, uh, love uh, fantasy novels, which try to really deliberately stem from different sources mm -hmm. and and play with the racial stereotypes in a completely different way. And great a great example for me is is is, uh, is Andrzej Sapkowski and his Witcher series, which I for, for this actually quite maybe I don't know. Uh, that's kind of funny thing here in, in Istanbul because uh, I don't know how it's how the Witcher is perceived here. Do you, you know Witcher? The, the, it's like no, the kind of it's Polish. A, it's a very popular. It's a very popular thing. Mm -hmm. So so because um, uh, yeah, we are talking about the representation of the East, but for us in Central and say Eastern Europe, you know, for us like Witcher is actually Eastern, meaning like it's it's it's kind of like Eastern European mm -hmm. uh, because it stems from Slavic from Slavic mythology and from kind of like Slavic folklore. And it's really kind of using different, distinctly different methodology from um, uh, myth mythology from from from the uh, from the Anglo-Saxon one. And uh, but at the same time, yeah, it's, it's it's a question of identity. Like, what is it? You know, uh, like Eastern Slavic uh, uh, mythology. But I think he's like, and he's like, um, really playfully, Sapkowski working with, uh, for example, in his in his uh, in his works, you can find racism. And you, you can say you know, like like uh, there are ghettos etc etc. So it's like deliberately working with the card of race, which uh, in in a comp much more subversive way uh, than than you can find in in Tolkien. And it's kind of like I, I think that's kind of what what fantasy can also like do, as as you said, like it, it's it's a great space of imagination which can be eclectic and can like use real world problems and real world uh, kind of uh, issues and traumas and and make some imaginable space. Mm -hmm. Where you see different possibilities. So, uh, actually, I have a, s a kind of small question, maybe uh, thematically, but it is. I think it's important and to all of us. But this representation of women mm. in this video games, because in uh, each of the uh, talks, actually, we had some links to that, especially with Theodora or like with Prince of Persia also. And also, I was very um, 
curious to uh, see that like in this war games actually we cannot see at all the woman so um what do you think about it because in actually in modern age or now with this uh, rise of feminism we are seeing also this um this interest in the uh, historical model of the powerful woman mm -hmm. and it was something that was discussed uh, we discussed with Emir in the exhibition also that yes we can see that Theodora is a, a figure of femme fatale mm -hmm. but also she is a powerful figure so uh, what do you think about it uh, both in the case of how it is not seen uh, like victim or like a uh, powerful woman in uh, war games mm -hmm. and also how it is still there in this kind of um, games like Assassin's Creed. Mm. Can I just, yeah, uh, thank you very much. Yes, I think that is, is really fascinating and it's something I've really sort of, I've reflected on as a female gamer, mm. but so often that when I play games, uh, I have to play with the avatar of a male protagonist mm -hmm. and I'm supposed to sort of uh, identify with the male protagonist. Uh, and that has sometimes irritated me because I do experience a different immersion when I can play as a female avatar, for instance. Um, but I do think we are seeing a change um, just to f like continue with the Assassin's Creed and with uh, uh, a lot of the Bioware games and things like that and that they are consciously focusing on featuring more like fleshed out, believable, strong mm. female characters. <coughs> but I do think like sort of the stereotypical depiction of Theodora mm. as a femme fatale mm. is, um, is, is sort of playing on old tropes mm -hmm. um, and is sort of showing what has been but not necessarily what will be. And I do think that we are going to see like more interesting female characters going forward. But I do think that again, that probably has, and Vic probably knows this much better than I do, something to do with the idea that gaming has been marketed largely to a male audience in which they want to have a male avatar and where the f women are sort of like window dressing. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I do find it quite fascinating that in the latest Assassin's Creed game, it's sort of the canonical uh, main character is that you play as a woman and you are just as, you know, uh, physically and, and mentally powerful as the male character, for instance. Mm -hmm. So I do think there is a shift there going forward. But yeah, mm -hmm. things take time. Okay, so before ending, maybe of you want to add something about the panel? Yeah, I basically want to thank our speakers and I want to do that also in a particular way, saying that uh, we are at the Swedish Research Institute, we are not developing any games yet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the clues we have come is that last year we did, in collaboration with Koch University, we did, uh, we, we did work on a digital exhibition. You can find it under the Koch University homepage, which is about context between uh, Byzantium and the Viking world. Uh, and as part of that we did a collaboration also with a group of uh, two Swedish comic artists whose uh, uh, comic you can actually also find in the uh, book windows of Yapi Kredi, uh, which have written this comic about the Viking girl who goes to Constantinople. Uh, so as part of that, if you go to the homepage you can click of the website, you can click yourself through various panels and see how she goes from the north and comes the whole way to Marketplace in Constantinople. And uh, finally the last scene is inside the Hagia Sophia itself, where you can see how the famous uh, graffiti by the Varingian uh, Halfdan is made up on the gallery. Uh, so as part of this, uh, when we move and finalize this exhibition, we also fashioned these little mugs where you can see oh. the scene uh, with Halfdan on the gallery and his rune. So I'm very happy now to, as a little thanks from our institute, to give both to our speakers and to our moderator each one one of these little mugs. <laughs> so and that and website is full of academic articles also related to the relationship with Biden and Tina. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, yes. I think so. I it love that. It, I it love is, it. It is, uh, <laughs> It is a, co a collection of articles, exactly, and uh, uh, 
uh, this has the somewhat complicated name uh, Nordic Tales Byzantine Paths. Yeah. So you can find actually the website on the mugs. <laughs> <laughs> it's an experience for all of people, I think. Like yes, that was the idea. Unification for academics, for for academics who wants to have fun. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> Which I think is what it's all very much about, also tonight. Yeah. So thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.